Covered calls or selling call options against a long stock position or against stock that you already own is, in my experience, one of the most common places for new options traders to get started. It doesn't require a lot of approvals from your broker, it's relatively easy to do, and it comes with some significant benefits. So let's talk about why people want to sell covered calls in the first place, then we'll do a few basics and we'll look at some examples. Now, if you're already familiar with how options work and you know what call options are, you might want to skip ahead a little bit further into the video where we start talking about the strategy more specifically. But for those of you that are new to options trading in general or just covered calls overall, covered calls are, I could summarize the benefits that we have from covered calls as, as basically three things. Well, two things really, and then maybe a supplemental third. One is that it's a great way to generate income. So if you are interested in making sure that the assets that you own in your portfolio, and a lot of investors are, is generating a maximum amount of income, well, selling covered calls is one of the ways to do that. It's, it's very difficult to match the kind of income that you can get from selling covered calls. Number two, covered calls or selling option premium in general is a great way to hedge risk. So if the market is a little choppy or if a stock has recently been declining or, or it looks likely to start declining in the short term, then covered calls provide some uh, risk protection in that sense. And then finally, number three, and for this one, if you want to do a little bit more research, I have a great video on selling uh, short puts or put selling or put writing, which is uh, a strategy that goes hand in hand with selling covered calls. When you short puts, you oftentimes will wind up owning the stock that you were selling puts on. Well, maybe not often, but it's not uncommon for you to wind up doing that. So it's one of the reasons why we only sell short puts on stocks that you'd want to own in the first place. Well, once you own the stock, selling covered calls is a very similar risk profile. It's a very similar set of benefits, but you're doing it once you own the stock. So the two strategies can be deployed within the same portfolio very easily where an investor might be starting out by selling puts on a particular stock that they really like. Once the, the stock is put to them, if it's a, the stock has gone through a drawdown or something like that, then they may start selling covered calls against it to continue ramping up that income. So let's talk about some of the basics of covered calls. Now, there are some basic terminology that we need to keep in mind, uh, and I, I'll jot down a few of these here, but I think one of the best ways for us to be able to look at this is to think about this as kind of a diagram. So, so let's imagine that uh, you're here and you own uh, 100 shares of stock. Options are priced in increments of 100 shares, so uh, if you're selling covered calls, you're selling them on a, a per contract basis that represents 100 shares. So if you had 500 shares of stock, then you'd be selling five contracts. If you have 100 shares of stock, then you'd be selling one contract. So let's say for the sake of simplicity here that you own 100 shares of stock. And over here, we have another investor who uh, maybe they don't own any of the stock, but they might be interested in it. So what a covered call does is that you, you think you take the position of the seller. So in this case, uh, you're the seller. We'll just jot that down here. And then we have our counterpart here who is acting as the, the buyer of that covered call. The, the buyer of the call, basically they have the right to exercise the contract and it gives them the ability to buy the stock from you at a set price before the contract expires. So that set price is called a strike price. We'll talk about that here in a minute. And as the seller, here you have an obligation. If the buyer wants to execute their contract, so if they want to exercise it, then you have an obligation to provide those shares. So you are selling a covered call on shares that you already own. And there's the potential that you might wind up selling those shares if the stock rises quite a bit and it's worth it for the buyer to actually do that. So it is possible for those shares to then be transferred to the buyer. Now, the buyer, in order to acquire this right, they are in turn paying for it in the form of a premium. This is where that income comes in. Now, 
One of the great things about selling options, whether we're talking about puts or call options, is that that premium is yours to keep. So uh, even if the buyer does not actually exercise their option, you still get to keep that. And if they do exercise their option, you also still get to keep that. So this, considering the fact that most options, including call options and put options, expire worthless, this winds up putting the odds very much in your favor. So let's say that you own some stock and maybe that stock is currently worth, it has a share price. Let's do a quick share price here. Has a share price of $50 uh, per share. And you decide that uh, maybe the stock is at a resistance level or something like that, where it's unlikely to continue rising. So you want to sell some covered calls to make some income as well as hedging your risk. So maybe you'll sell calls with a strike price that is above the current stock price. And we'll talk about why we do that here in just a second. So I'm just gonna abbreviate this, that you're selling covered calls at, uh, let's say at 52.50, something like that. So a lot of options are priced in increments, strike prices in increments of $2.50 or $5, which is more common. So in that case, what has basically happening here is that the, the buyer and the seller have made an agreement that if the seller wish, if the buyer wishes, the buyer has that right, they can buy the stock that is currently worth $50 a share. Well, they can buy it for $52.50 per share. Now they're not gonna do that unless before the expiration date, so unless before the expiration date, the stock price is rising to the point where it is above $52.50. Now I should note here that it is possible for a option to be exercised early before its expiration. So uh, options here in the US, they're called American style options on, on stocks. And they, they are, it is theoretically possible to be able to exercise them early, although it is very rare. In the many years I've been doing this, I have seen it, but it's kind of unusual. So uh, generally you can assume that you're not gonna get exercised if exercise is gonna happen. So if the stock rises above your strike price, then all of a sudden the buyer, now they have something that's worth it. So hypothetically, let's say that the stock rises to $55 per share. Well, of course, they're gonna then exercise their option because they have the ability to uh, buy the stock for $52.50 that is currently worth $55 per share. So you're obligated to sell it at $52.50 because at the time that you sold the option, that that scenario wasn't the case. But now a little bit later, well, maybe the stock has risen. We'll take a look at this in a specific example, as well as how do we minimize the potential for that happening to us? Ideally, we don't like to get called out. It's not a bad outcome, but we like to minimize that as much as possible. So the expiration date, options expire on their monthly as well as weekly expirations. Generally speaking, for a uh, covered call, we're usually looking to sell something that has an expiration date that is 30 to 45 days out in the future. The way that options are priced, they, they are more expensive the longer there is until expiration. And that sounds attractive, but actually on a per day basis, it's better to sell options repeatedly throughout the year rather than just one long option. You make a lot more money. In fact, theoretically, if there were no cost to trading, you'd wanna sell options that are very short time until expiration, but 30 to 45 days is kind of a sweet spot between the benefit that you get uh, from the premium at that time frame and reducing your trading costs as much as possible because that's just a reality we're gonna to have to deal with. It's something that we can control, so we should in fact control that. All right, finally, let's take a look at in, out, or, out of, or at the money. Now, let's pretend here that we're working with our scenario where we have a $50 stock. I'm just gonna make a little scale here. So we have a $50 stock, that's the current price. Well, if you are selling a call option, you are likely to be selling it with a strike price. So let's just say we've got a strike price up here, 52.50, that is above the current stock price. That strike price, we would call that out of the money. So I'm gonna abbreviate that as OTM. So it is out of the money. Now, it is actually possible for you to be selling an option that is almost exactly equal, that has a strike price that's almost exactly equal to the stock price. So that would be at $50 per share. Uh, that's unusual to be able to, to pinpoint it like that, but it can happen. And theoretically, we would call that the at the money strike price. More commonly, investors who are uh, trading a lot in the options market, anything that's really close to the strike 
to the current stock price, but maybe off by a few cents. Those are called the at-the-money strike price. Now, uh, if we go below the current strike price, so let's say that the uh, the strike price was at $48 per share, uh, that is in the money, and we are generally not selling them. Now, that may sound a little bit weird to investors who are new to options trading because the premium for in-the-money options is higher. So theoretically, doesn't it make sense to sell an option with a higher premium, collect that bigger income? Well, the problem is it's far more likely to get exercised. Most options expire worthless because most of the trading is being done out of the money. But it, you, you could certainly sell in the money, but you are increasing the likelihood you're going to get called out. And the extrinsic value, that excess premium in the option, is actually fairly small within the money options relative to out of the money options. So yes, the premium's larger, but it's actually the extra premium, the, the extrinsic value is actually lower than with an out of the money option. The back testing that has been done, and there's even some ETFs that replicate a covered call selling strategy. We'll talk about some of the problems here in a minute, but they uh, never sell in the money. They always assume that you're going one strike price out of the money because it gives you room for the stock to move up so to be able to harvest some of that capital appreciation before you're at risk of actually being called out. So with that in mind, let's take a look at a couple of examples. So here I have a chart of a very interesting stock this year, ADP, which has been uh, benefiting quite a bit from the labor shortage as wages have been going up and uh, hiring has recommenced. A lot of employment stocks have looked really good. Well, let's put yourself in this situation where uh, maybe you own ADP, maybe you've purchased it recently, or maybe you're buying it on the date that I'm showing it on my chart, which was May 18th, 2021. The, at the time, the stock was priced at 192.54. Now, an investor who wanted to go with the general rule of thumb of selling one move out of the money, they would be selling to open a covered call that expired about, in this case, almost exactly 30 days later on the 18th of June, 2021. And the strike price was $195. So they're selling the 195 uh, covered calls with a June expiration. Now, the premium at the time was $3 per, per share or $300 per contract. Now, let's just pretend that the stock is not going to move anywhere, that it just is a, a complete rope and it, and it does not move at all. Well, it, we could divide $3 by the share price and we find a return over that month of 1.5%. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but on a compounded basis, that's 20% per year. That is actually very good. If we, we look at it like that, this is a, one of the greatest ways to really ramp up that overall uh, income or return in your, in your portfolio that is difficult to match in any other way. Now, the other benefit of selling covered calls is that it reduces our break even. So think about it like this. Let's pretend that you did buy the stock at 192.54 on, on that day, on, on May 18th. And you sold those, those covered calls immediately. And in fact, that trade doing that is called a buy right. Well, 192.54 minus $3 in premium, which if we assume we do not close this trade early or anything like that, then that, that money is your to keep, yours to keep. Well, if the stock winds up dropping a little bit, you've basically built in a $3 per share hedge. So it's reduced your break even from 192.54, where you bought in on the stock, to 189.54. So if the market goes flat, you make money. If the market goes down a little bit, you make money. If the market goes up, you make money. It, you only lose money if the market drops a lot. Whereas if you just buy the shares, well, if the market goes flat, you don't make anything. If it goes down a little bit, you lose. If it goes down a lot, you lose. It, you only make money if it goes up over time. Now, that's not an unreasonable assumption, but selling covered calls gives us that hedge. So there's a lot more potential to be able to make money. So let's see what actually uh, came about. I'm going to just fast forward my chart here just a little bit. And as we get closer to uh, June 18th, so there we go. So June uh, 18th, where my cursor is right now, the stock actually closed at... Uh, out of the money. So uh, the, the option was not likely to be exercised. In fact, it would be a, a huge surprise if that was the case. 
So it's not called out that $3 was the investors to keep. And in fact, on June 18th, the stock closed at 192.90. So they uh, had a little bit of capital appreciation in the stock, uh, 40 cents or so, and plus the $3. So they would have outperformed investors who were just buying and holding. So they were just investing in the stock and then uh, holding it over that same period of time. And in fact, they would have outperformed on an annualized basis by more than 20% compared to a investor who is just buying and holding. All right, now at this point, we gotta take a, a step back. I want you to notice something in the chart that I've shown you. The, you'll notice that my hypothetical investor in this scenario, she sold a covered call as the stock was bumping up against the prior high. Resist, from a technical perspective, we'd say that's a potential resistance layer. Now the stock consolidated there for a while, we had a brief excursion above that level, and then it came right back down to it. So technical consolidations like this, they happen all the time. Technicians like myself, we look for those on purpose. That's the ideal time to be considering a covered call trade when your estimate for the likelihood for a, a big move to the upside is relatively low so that you're not giving up a lot of uh, opportunity cost. Well, let's switch this just a little bit. So you'll notice that the day that my cursor is on, and I'm gonna move that out of the way just a little bit. You'll notice that that red day that my cursor was on, that was expiration day. Now, most investors who use technical analysis to optimize when they're selling covered calls or, or short puts or whatever it is, they're gonna avoid doing it on that day. But let's just pretend for the sake of this example that you're impartial, that you don't care whether it's at support, where the likelihood that the stock is likely to bounce is relatively high. So you would normally not want to sell a covered call at that point because you are capping your potential gains. You'd probably want to hold out a little bit until the stock had risen a little bit. Maybe it had gotten back to a resistance level. But let's say that you did anyway. So in this case, the following Monday was June 21st, 2021. The stock was priced at 196.47. In this case with ADP, they have options that have strike prices in increments of $5, or that was the case at the time. Sometimes that'll change a little bit. And so there was an option available at the 200 strike price that would have been the first out of the money strike price. So in this case, the investor is looking out about a month in expiration that the third Friday in July, although there are weekly options available, it's usually very liquid, it's easy to trade, uh, not a lot of costs associated with it in forms of the bid and the ask. So that option expired on the 16th of July, 2021 at the 200 strike, and they would have been paid $1.27. Now it was a lot lower this time because the current stock price was further away from that strike price that they wanted to sell. Uh, the further you are out of the money, the cheaper the option is. But even in this case, that's still a material hedge, $1.27 per share, protection to the downside. It's 0.6% return, or on a compounded basis, that's still 8% per year. Uh, in fact, that's the long-term annual uh, percentage return of the S&P 500. So that's still not bad. And that's on top of the potential for capital appreciation between the where the stock is priced right now versus your strike price at $200. All right, so it's lowered our break even. If we subtract $1.27 from $196.47, we get a break even price of $195.20. So there's a little bit of risk protection there as well. Uh, if the stock winds up trending flat or just volatile consolidation and so forth, you're a lot better off with the covered call than you would be just by buying and holding. Now let's fast forward a little bit. Let's see how this actually wind up playing out. And you can probably tell, I use this example on purpose because I wanna talk in very frank terms about the disadvantage of covered calls. On the one hand, they provide a lot of benefits. Income is a huge benefit, a hedge to the downside. That is a very difficult benefit to match in any other way. However, it does present the potential for opportunity costs. So in this case, by the time that the stock was, uh, or the option was expiring, so this is July 16th, it was priced at $205.60. Now, as the covered call seller, put yourself in this situation. You would have made $1.27 per share, so $127 per contract, which is yours to keep. But the stock got called out from you at 200. So if we put that together, your total profits were $4.80 because you still make that difference between 196.47, that's where we started the trade, and $200, your strike price. So, so you still made that money, 357, plus you add the premium that you collected of $1.27, and we get the 480. 
So that sounds pretty good. But in this case, this is one of those situations where the buy and hold trader, they would have done better than you. They, if just by buying and holding, they would have been profitable to the tune of $9.13 per share. So this is an important disadvantage. It's an important one for us to think about for a, a number of reasons. One, it's a way I'm reinforcing my point about why we use technical analysis to sell covered calls at resistance levels and not at support levels. Now, we're not always gonna be able to perfectly time the market, but we can certainly put the odds in our favor that we're gonna do a better job than just arbitrarily and mechanically uh, doing that. However, long-term studies have shown over and over again that even if you had mechanically done it, every impartially, every month, you were just selling covered calls, it underperforms in bull markets, but outperforms in bear markets and in choppy kind of sideways markets. So on the whole, a covered call strategy, even one that is mechanically uh, without any nuance or optimization, still performs very well in the sense that it is less risky. It, the returns are a lot smoother. So an investor, they may underperform in a bull market, but they are also taking on less risk. So on a risk-adjusted basis, their performance is actually better. So let's talk about a, a few of these rules, just do a little recap. When we're selling covered calls, the general rule of thumb to optimize the amount of income that we can make with uh, not incurring too many costs is to look for expiration dates that are 30 to 45 days into the future. We usually wanna go one strike price out of the money unless you're really confident about where that stock is going and you still wanna sell a covered call but you wanna give it more room to move to the upside. Well, you can go even further out of the money if you wish. So there's flexibility there to adjust for your confidence level in how well you think the stock is actually gonna perform. And then finally, sell covered calls when the stock is near resistance or within a consolidation range not when it's breaking out, when the odds are further in your favor for capital appreciation, where the, the price of the stock is likely to rise, we wait until we can sell the calls uh, when there is uh, less likelihood that we're gonna give up some of that opportunity cost. And speaking of opportunity costs, let me just address that really quick in another context. It, it is possible, and this is a question that I get all the time, can you close this trade early? Absolutely. So for example, investors will frequently sell a covered call and then maybe there's a market disruption of some kind and their stock drops with the rest of the market out there. Well, those calls are gonna fall in value. And in fact, sometimes they can fall in value a lot. Well, investors in that situation, as the stock drops to a support level, they wind up buying those calls back where they may be able to harvest most of the potential gain that they could have made from holding them all the way through till expiration. They wind up buying them back at that point keeping the difference between what they were able to sell them for originally versus what they're able to buy them back for, sometimes even just a few days later, when it's at a support level. Then they wait for the stock to bounce and they sell it again at a resistance level. A lot of investors take advantage of that. There's no reason why you wouldn't. Now, I also do talk to investors sometimes. I don't generally advise this, but they don't want to be called out. So they buy back their calls at a loss. You can do that but it, it doesn't really change the overall profit or loss of your trade. So if there are other reasons why you do not want to lose possession of that stock, then you would want to buy them back even if it were at a loss. However, if you are in that kind of circumstance, and that's rare, but if you were in that circumstance, then selling covered calls may not be the ideal strategy for you. But remember, if you, there's no reason for you to hold onto the stock, buying back the calls at a loss, it doesn't actually change your overall reward from the trade uh, compared to just being called out. So generally speaking, I usually tell investors, don't buy them back, just let them be exercised. And at that point, once the stock is has been exercised and you no longer own it, it's been called away from you, well, this is where we deploy our other income strategy, which is shorting puts. So writing puts on a stock you do not own has a risk profile that is almost identical to covered calls. It has almost the same advantages as well as the potential disadvantages of opportunity cost. And of course, both of them have uh, risk to the downside if the stock drops. But the, the traders will alternate between these strategies. As they are called out, they'll wind up writing puts again to ramp up their income. 
until they are put the stock, then they're selling covered calls again until they are called out and they'll just alternate between these two. So it's a very flexible paired strategy to use on a portfolio where you're managing your exposure to a stock rather than just buying and holding in a really passive way. So covered calls, it's a great strategy. It's very common for investors to start there when they're just getting into options trading because it requires low levels of option approval uh, from your broker, margin isn't required and so forth. And it's a great way to get familiar with the options market without uh, taking on a lot of uh, risk that you might be missing something just through lack of experience. So in addition to paper trading, this is one of the great ways that I always recommend that investors think about getting started in the options market as they're trying to really ramp up their returns in their portfolio.